we are in the Gospel of Mark, and we'll be in Mark chapter 6, and we'll be reading from verse 30 and on. Mark chapter 6, from verse 30 and on. The word of the Lord says this in Mark chapter 6, verse 30. The apostles returned to Jesus and told him all that they had done and taught. And he said to them, Come away by yourselves to a desolate place and rest a while. For many were coming and going, and they had no leisure even to eat. And they went away in the boat to a desolate place by themselves. Now many saw them going and recognized them, and they ran there on foot from all the towns and got there ahead of them. When he went ashore, he saw a great crowd, and he had compassion on them, because they were like sheep without a shepherd. And he began to teach them many things. And when it grew late, his disciples came to him and said, This is a desolate place, and the hour is now late. Send them away to go into the surrounding countryside and villages and buy themselves something to eat. But he answered them, You give them something to eat. And then they said to him, Shall we go and buy two hundred denarii worth of bread and give them to eat? And he said to them, How many loaves do you have? Go and see. And when they had found out, they said, Five and two fish. So they sat down in groups by hundreds and by fifties. And taking the five loaves and the two fish, he looked up to heaven and said a blessing and broke the loaves and gave them to his disciples to set before the people. And he divided them, two fish among them all. And they, were, and they all ate and were satisfied. And they took up the twelve baskets full of broken pieces and of the fish. And those who ate the loaves were 5,000 men. Let's pray. Lord, what an interesting account, Lord. What an interesting narrative here. There's a great crowd. Christ has compassion upon them. But yet there's nothing to eat. There's There's no provision in the wilderness, Lord. But yet Christ in his power is able to provide, Lord. Help us to understand fully what this text means, Lord. Help us to... In a real experiential way, Lord, grab a hold of what the text is communicating, Lord. It's more than food for a valley, Lord. It's more than food for our stomachs, Lord. It's namely Christ and Christ himself, Lord. Help us this hour, Lord. Help us this this time, Lord, where the word is preached and heard, Lord, to truly be gripped in our affections by what's being taught in the text, Lord. We ask this for Christ's sake and in his name. Amen. Amen. Well, last week... If you remember, if you were here last week, we heard of what? King Herod's party, a blood bath, right? At the end of it, John the Baptist's head is given out on the platter for all to see, right? Herod is loving it. He's pleasing his guests. His wife is now happy. And it's just a horrible scene of sin. That's Herod's party. That's Herod's style of party. He cares for himself. He's trying to please others in a sinful way. But look at the Feast of Christ. It's a humble scene. There's no bloodbath. There's no sinfulness. There's no caring for himself more than... No, it's the exact opposite of Herod's party, right? Christ giving himself over to the masses and the crowds. Christ caring for his disciples. Christ caring and seeing a people that are like sheep without a shepherd and having compassion upon them. But the sad reality is this. More people would rather go to Herod's party. More people would rather see the spectacle at Herod's party than to be with Christ and his humility and his humble offering of the bread. And we're going to see what this really communicates in a second. But let's get right into the text. Verses 30 to 32 tell of what? Disciples bringing back a report. Right? Christ sent them out. They were to go from house to house, preaching and teaching and healing, using oils when was necessary for the sick. And they were excited. They were zealous. They were pumped up to give a report for what had just taken place. Christ, you wouldn't believe it. What you told us would happen. The authority you gave us, we did it. We used it. The teaching that you've been teaching us, we used it and hearts were gripped. They're coming back, hyped up, excited, zealous, but like Christ in his wisdom and his compassion, what does he see? He sees tired faces. He sees faces that are weary. He sees hearts that are excited on the one hand, but could really use some rest. The disciples are tired and Christ can see it. They're hungry and they can see it. But what we see here is what? Zeal 
and fatigue can co- coexist. Being excited about the things of the Lord amidst life's struggles and pains, they're not two different things. No, you can enjoy good zeal and, and fight in the and fighting in the good fight of faith while still being tired and fatigued. That these things aren't mutually exclusive. You can't, oh now I'm tired, so my zeal's down. I'm fatigued, so my zeal. No, no, these things happen together. You're you're being zealous, you're involved in the fight, and you're going out and you're sharing the good news, you're ministering to your family, and you get tired. And you grow fatigue. That's natural. That that's completely natural. But Christ what? He sends them to rest. There's an element here which we've been seeing all through Mark. It's called wilderness theology. It's a constant theme in Mark and in the Bible. Wilderness, your needs are highlighted. There's no resources there. You're fatigued. You're looking around. You can't find anywhere to get water. The beasts are also hungry in the wilderness. Might even come and attack you. But then there's rest. There's always rest at the end of the wilderness. That's the Bible, right? The wilderness, the pilgrimage, rest, rest. The wilderness, the pilgrimage, rest. But rest is what? It's to restore our fuel. Not to stay there forever. Not to keep resting forever. No, to restore it. So what we see here is the disciples coming back, excited. Christ seeing their fatigue and and their need of rest. And he grants it to them. Verse 33, let's read that one. Verse 33 says this. Now many saw them going and recognized them. And they ran there on foot from all the towns that got there ahead of them. 34. When he went ashore, he saw a great crowd. We'll stop there. There is no reason to think that Christ told the disciples to get off the boat right off the bat. Many commentators agree, and I I would agree with them as well, that Christ likely, seeing the crowds running, trying to get to the next village ahead of them, Christ probably thought, you know, we probably won't dock. We probably won't go ashore yet. Let's hang out here in the water for a bit, because you guys need rest. You guys need to refuel before we go back out and feed the masses again spiritual food. See, rest is meant to refuel us to go back out, serving and resting, serving and resting. But the danger is, if you've read Pilgrim's Progress, is what Christian, what, goes to rest and he stays there and he sleeps and he stays there and he sleeps. And he begins to what? Essentially grow weak. Because he's only enjoying rest. No, rest is not a never-ending luxury. That's the danger of rest. That's the the bad side of rest. So if you feel like you're resting too much, then yes, I, I would advise you, you probably are. But if you're not resting enough, that's also dangerous. If you're not ever allowing your soul to have rest, that is a very dangerous thing. And verse 34, we'll finish the rest of that. It says, When he went ashore, he saw a great crowd, and he had compassion on them. Because they were like sheep without a shepherd. And he began to teach many things. Like sheep without a shepherd. Here Christ, the Greek, shows something of the of the innermost parts of a man. Right? I, I hate to use this reference, but they used to say that Tupac used to be able to rap like no other man. Because he would he would rap from the pits of his stomach. Right? You hear everybody rap up here. No, well, Tupac would, would really feel it. Right? That's what Christ is feeling. You're from the pits of his stomach. He looks out and sees what? Sees what? People without a shepherd. And he's moved to the core. All of his insides, all of his whole person, his whole being, to the deep, deep aspects of who he was. He feels compassion as a sheep without a shepherd. In Numbers 27, we see Moses ready to pass the torch to Joshua. Right? And what is what is Moses, what does God tell Moses? Set up a man to go and to take care of Israel after you so that they will not be a sheep without a shepherd. Right? If anyone knows that the Old Testament is supposed to meant us give us a, a highlight to the future, Joshua, a type of Christ, the shepherd is coming. Right? Moses, a type of Christ, the one who's leading through the wilderness. All that the Old Testament foreshadowed, we're seeing elements of that here now in this text. A sheep without a shepherd. This is a common theme in the Old Testament. In fact, Ezekiel 34 is an indictment against the shepherds of Israel. God looks out and he says, The shepherds have been coming, eating, leaving, and not caring for the sheep. The shepherds are coming and going as if they don't even care about the sheep. And God says, I will judge the shepherds of Israel 
for the way they've been leading the people. Listen, I can't think of a more perfect reality to explain what I see going on in large evangelicalism today. Shepherds feeding themselves, shepherds taking care of themselves, but never really caring for the hearts of the people. I won't spend too much time there. It's just a small nice side note. If your shepherd, if your pastor doesn't know who you are, how is he to keep an account for your soul? If he doesn't know his own sheep, is he really the shepherd of that sheep's heart is the question. But let's move on. What we see here is actually something really important, especially in verse 30, the end of verse 34, it says, and he began to teach them many things. We all know what's going to come, right? The feeding of the 5,000. Everybody knows that that's what's on the brink. But even Christ, he feeds the soul before he feeds the belly. Take notice of the order. He feeds the spiritual before the physical. He feeds them in their sanctification through the spiritual means before he brings them relief in the physical realm of their body. He gives them the word of God before he gives them the bread, as it were, of God. He feeds their spiritual hunger before their physical hunger. He feeds the inner man before the outer man. Because he knows if these individuals are going to survive in the wilderness, what they need more than physical bread is what? The word of God and to feed upon that. Beloved, if we're going to survive in the wilderness called life, what we need most is the word of God. More than material bread aspects more than even a full belly what we need is the word of god like job said your words O lord i have treasured more than food but i would ask if you look at your week are you eating spiritual food consuming spiritual food on the same even level as you're consuming physical food of course every time you take a meal you're not going to read the word no but what i'm saying is when you're hungry you start to get a little hangry. You feed. You feed yourself. Right? No one misses a meal if they can avoid it. No one passes up a snack if they can. Someone's hungry. You get offered a little bag of uh, uh, a chips or something. You take it. Because you feel, you know, your, your stomach's grumbling. I want to eat. Well, I'm, what I'm saying is, are you feeding your soul in that same way? Can you pick up little snacks throughout the day? Can you meditate on Christ even in your heart? Can you... Remember what you studied that morning. Are you leaving the house saying, I can never leave the house without breakfast, but you leave the house without spiritual breakfast? See, these are all realities. Christ knows what I see before me is a spiritual need even more than the physical need. But we go on to verse 35 and 36. And when it grew late, his disciples came to him and said, This is a desolate place, and the hour is now late. Send them away to go into the surrounding countryside and villages and buy themselves something to eat. A concern arises. The disciples see it's getting kind of dark, right? It's late. We're in the wilderness. There's no uh, easy marketplace to go buy food from. It's actually 5,000 men. So there's actually families that are also here that aren't even accounted for. And Jesus' response is kind of funny in verse 37, isn't it? But he answered them, you go, you give them something to eat. Christ is, you know, they, he obviously sees them empty hand and he says, you give them something. The point is, we're going to need to find something to eat for these people. And it isn't send them away. We got to give them food. We got to take care of them. And then they said, shall we go and spend 200 denarii? That's about a year's worth of salary and wages. A year's worth of bread and give it to them. And he says what? How many loaves do you have? Go and see. And they found out and they said they have five and two fish. Surely, okay, the rest of this, we'll read in a second. Surely there was some murmuring, murmuring from the disciples, right? Surely some of the disciples are thinking, this guy's crazy. Is this guy serious? Spend all of our money? And when we see later on, he's saying, organize them in little, little circles. He wants us to organize this, five, this group of 5,000 individuals. You know how hard it is to, to, to herd sheep, as it were? You know how hard it is to herd cattle? To tell a huge mass, okay, you go here, you go here. This guy wants us to do this based on what? Loaves, small loaves of bread and small amount of fish. Surely, surely the disciples thought Christ has no idea what he's asking us to do. But we'll finish the text 
here, 41 to 44, and taking the five loaves and the two fish, he looked up to heaven and said a blessing and broke the loaves and gave them to the disciples to set before the people. And he divided the two fish among them all. And they all ate and were satisfied. The amazing, listen, the amazing supernatural ability of Christ. You're so numb to this story. I know you are. You've heard the story a thousand times. You've even watched your kids grow up and watch it on the little videos that they show for the kids. You've seen it in children's stories. Even the world loves to tell this story. You are so numb to this. I'm so numb to this. He's just taken nothing and fed 5,000 individuals with it. This is amazing. This is supernatural. There's so much to learn from this. So just a quick recap. We see Christ, the disciples return. Jesus wants their rest. We see a crowd come. He's preaching. There's no food and he feeds 5,000 men and their families. But how are you going to be moved by the gospel in this text? Right? How are you going to be moved on in your affections and your heart by this story? Let me tell you what real preaching is real quick before we move on. Real preaching is not an academic lecture. Real preaching are not little cute stories to help you carry on. Real preaching is looking at the text, expounding the text, giving the ins and outs of the text, and then that's where a lot of reform preaching ends. I've done my job. I've explained the text. I've given you the Greek. I've given you the, the cultural elements, the context. Holy Spirit, do your job, and I'm done. No. No way. Real preaching includes bringing the text to bear on your every single day in life. Experiential preaching, not just facts, not just academics. Why? Because what I'm looking at is a group of individuals who aren't going to go tomorrow morning to debate theology in some ivory tower. What I'm seeing is a group of sheep who in every single different life is going through different things, some enjoying high times, some suffering through the low times, some wondering what this week is going to like, some battling sickness, right? So if I'm not preaching this text to your heart, if I'm not giving you how this comes to bear on you in 2019, I'm giving you nothing for the week, as it were. So this story, what is the application for us? Number one, I'd say rest to the glory of God. Rest to the glory of God. Two, realizing the power of Christ. And three, the power of Christ. What is it? It's Christ. The power of Christ is what? It's Christ himself. So number one, rest to the glory of God. See, some love rest too much, okay? Some only rest. So my only advice for you is you got to be tired before you get rest. If you're never tired, then that's a different story. But to those of you who are tired, who are just flat out drained with life, those of you who are exhausted by the lack of true rest in Christ, I pray that you would hear this sermon this morning and realize this is for you. God provides rest in the wilderness from all sides, from all enemies, from all struggles. Why? Why does God provide you rest? Isaiah 64 shows us. Isaiah is saying, remember when you took care of your people in the wilderness, when you led them through the Red Sea, remember when you gave them supernatural provision, bread falling from heaven, water coming from the rocks, the Red Sea parting. Remember when you did that, Lord. You granted your people rest for your glory. For your glory. So when you are done, when life is killing you and you're ready to throw in the towel, realize As you endure in that rest, as you fight for joy in Christ in that rest, as you don't give in to the lies and the schemes of the evil one, rest will come. And you will be you will give God glory for how you handled those seasons of life. See, you're even secondary in your trials. Isn't that such a blessing that you are just a secondary purpose in your trials? What's the primary purpose? That God will get glory through His people, His sheep, fighting through the trials of life, being molded by Christ and what they're enduring. Right? It's like a fiery furnace. The more you're feeling the heat of life's trials, the more you actually will come out and be refined in Christ. 
you who are secondary will play, praise the Lord that he's primary, his glory. So it actually, right, what, when, when Moses is, is having a little, bit, a little bit of a discussion with God, right, and God says, please, Lord, don't have judgment on your people because the nations will say what? God was able to bring them out of Egypt, but he was not able to get them to the promised land. Lord, for your name's sake, be a faithful God and get them from Egypt to the promised land and keep them and hold them. Why? So that your glory will not diminish. So Christian, as you're suffering, as you're going through the hard elements of life, know that God is able to get you from the joy to the joy amidst the struggles because it depends on his glory at stake. Not even your life. His glory is at stake in your life. So he is faithful to keep you and deliver you and grant you rest. This is rest to the glory of God. This is really being sanctified and molded by life's troubles for the glory of God. Isn't it so such a comfort that Christians can know? Ultimately, my suffering is for a purpose. The world's suffering. The world goes through trials and they have nothing to look to, no one to look to, no purpose in the trials. But you, Christian, you can look at the trials and says, all things that befall me are for my good. All things that come my way are for my sanctification. All things that I'm going for is ultimately to prepare me for the, the day where I see Christ faith, face to face. What a beautiful reality that Christians can find comfort and rest knowing that God is able to get them relief, true relief. When you're needing rest, what does that mean? How do you go through rest? It doesn't mean do nothing. It doesn't mean stop every single day of your life. It doesn't even mean to empty your calendar of everything. No, when you need rest, what does that mean? It means quit running from task to task, busyness to busyness. Stop trying to fill up your calendar so you never have to deal with the suffering. So you never have to deal with the actual thing that's bringing your heart stress and turmoil. No, true rest is found in what? Being actively seeking to be alone with Christ. At his throne of grace. In his word. So rest is actually really an active thing. Purposely, intentionally seeking to find time to be with Christ and finding rest from your soul. Which leads me to number two. Realizing the power of Christ even amidst life's struggles and our rest. See, like you and like me, these disciples are very, very human. Right? They forget who is on their side. They forget who is with them. We put more confidence in what we need rest from. We put more confidence in anxiety. We put more confidence in the struggles of life. We put more confidence and attention. And we give our hearts over to those things that distract us. But who is on the side of the disciples here? So listen, we come up with our own solutions. The disciples, what? We'll go, we'll, we'll go to town and spend a year's worth of salary if you want, Christ. We so easily become sidetracked and fatigued and worried because we forget Christ and his power. Do you not remember what we've been studying? This man here in the text, Christ Jesus, is the man who raised a man from death to life. A, a little girl, I'm sorry. Who stopped a woman's bleeding that had been going on for 12 years by the hem of his garment. This man caused a lame man to walk, a, a leper to lose all of his leprosy instantly. That's who's here. That's this Christ. And the disciples what? Forget it. They think that the ability to turn this group of people to be satisfied by the food is too hard of a task for Christ. Christian, you think the same thing. You've seen Christ carry you from grace to grace to grace, day after day after year after year, right? You've seen Christ carry you and hold you. You've seen how he's delivered you from that trial and that suffering and how he, he was so faithful in this circumstance. But this circumstance, I don't know if you got me in this one, Christ. I don't know if you can deliver me in this one. Those ones, I see it, thank you. But this one, it just seems so unique. It seems so different. Listen. November 2019 is not too hard for Christ. November 2019 is not too difficult of a circumstance for Christ. Whatever you're going through, 
It is not too much for him to carry you through. Listen, these men were Jews. And they heard about the provision in the wilderness for Israel. The manna falling from heaven daily. They would go to sleep. They would wake up and there's bread everywhere. There's bread everywhere, Christian, is what I'm saying this morning. There's bread everywhere. Take of Christ freely. There's bread everywhere. Remember what your God has done for you. You've tasted and seen the goodness of Christ, Christian. You've seen his work on the cross on your behalf, taking care of the most difficult circumstance, your sin. You're telling me Christ is able to remedy the worst debt anyone has ever had against a holy God? And he's not able to carry you through this season of life? It's foolishness at the end of it. When we don't trust Christ, when we don't trust who he is, why? Why is this foolishness? Foolishness because we have such a low view of him. What we really need is what? What I say week in and week out. A bigger mind and heart for what Christ is able to do. Do I not sound like a tape recorder? Honestly. Every week you can just play because the same thing that I'm offering every week. Christ and Him crucified. I seek to know nothing amongst you except Christ and Him crucified. Why? Why do I preach Christ every single week? Because you need Christ every single week. Why do I tell you this this morning? It's because you need Christ every single morning and every single Lord's Day. You need to keep preaching the gospel to yourself to it's embedded and pounded into just your way of thinking. But we so easily forget the gospel. We so easily forget what he promises to do. His perfect record of keeping his word perfectly and faithfully. How do you find true joy? Here. Here in Christ. And there's actually some really good practical elements as well. Read 43 with me, verse 43. And they took up 12 baskets full of broken pieces and of the fish. See, Christ instructs them to pick up the leftovers. He just turned these weak little elements of five bread and two fish into feeding 5,000. And what does he do? Pick up the leftovers. Pick up the left. Why? Because the supernatural and the natural always mix together. We don't presume on God. We don't always expect a crazy miracle to happen. No, we must exercise wisdom. For instance, God will always sustain you. God will always carry you. God will always keep you. But don't test him by not reading your word, by not praying, by not seeking to see his will in these areas of your life, by not fellowshipping, by not taking advantage of the means of grace. So in this text, we see that God uses the very ordinary, practical elements of life. Right? Because he knows the disciples are going to need to eat for a couple more days. Pick up the leftovers. we got to eat still. I'm not going to always just raise up my hands and give out you know, food like crazy. No. Use the practical elements of daily living to the glory of God. Don't always depend on the miracle. You must go and pick up the leftovers of your life is what I'm saying this morning. Pray. Get in the word. Make the fight against the flesh. And God uses those very ordinary means of grace and turns them into ordinary graces day after day after day in the life of the Christian. But ultimately, this text even has a bigger point, a more fuller point. And now Mark thinks that we can figure it out on ourselves But thankfully, the Apostle John does not think that. The Apostle John in John 6 retells the same story from his point of view. Let's actually turn there now, John 6. A couple books over. And we'll be in John 6, and we'll read verse 31 through 35. So thankful for the multiple accounts of the gospel that we can get the different angles from which it was taught. Listen to verse 31 in John chapter 6. Verse 31. Our fathers ate the manna in the wilderness. As it is written, he gave them bread from heaven to eat. Jesus then said to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, it was not Moses who gave you the bread from heaven, but my Father gives you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is he who comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. They said to him, Sir, give us this bread always. Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me me shall not hunger, and whoever believes in me shall never 
thirst. He see Christ says he is the bread of life. Right? What's rest? Rest in seeing who, who Christ is, seeing who his power is. What's the power of Christ? It's Christ himself. It's Christ preached. Christ is the bread of life. Jesus wants them to be reminded and to think back of the wilderness when bread came down from heaven. Jesus is saying, I have come down from heaven. I am the true bread of life. Any who take of me and eat of me will not grow hungry nor thirst again. So Christian, feast on him and like those in the text, be satisfied fully. And the heart of the wilderness and the heart of those rough elements the lack of resources in the heart of your wilderness and your lack of resources and your lack of hope, what do you do? You feast upon Christ. Many in this room have their vital needs, their different needs, but vital needs. And you know in your heart, even now, you're starting to think of those worries and those needs that you have. Those worries that steal your rest in Christ. Well, this passage shows us that the Lord Jesus is fully and able and sufficient to meet our every need, both spiritually and physically. Listen, to be satisfied in Christ is to be satisfied in what He provides. Why? Because Christ provides Himself. He is the provision. We so often miss the blesser for the blessing, right? We so often miss the happy ending for the one who brought the happy ending. We miss the source for the means. So what I want you to understand this morning is that you, if you are to be satisfied, you'll be satisfied only because of Christ. Only because of what He's done. Only because of who He is. When life is in shambles, there's peace and rest in Christ. See, the problem is is how you might view this text. You see the provision. You see the masses. They're hungry. And you see the provision and you might think, oh, thank you, Lord. Thank you. Everyone's well fed. Thank you, Lord. You really came through. But thankfully, Christ says, no, the provision is not ultimate. I am ultimate, he says. Even if you have nothing, if you have Christ, you have everything. Until you get that right, even the provision will be a burden for you. Why? Because you'll always be depending on the provision. You'll always be a roller coaster up and down, up and down, going from provision to provision to provision, going from trial to trial to trial. Why? Because you're missing the point. You're missing Christ. You don't focus on just the provision. You focus on Christ, and that makes you stable in your trials. Right? You don't just thank God for those little provisions, the bread, right, the healing, the deliverance. No, you think the one who's giving the bread, the one who's giving the healing, the one who's giving you the deliverance. The Bible is Christocentric in all of its elements. Must Man must not live on bread alone, but on what? On Christ, who is the word that God preaches in his word. Who is the true bread? Who is the true word? It's Christ, Christian. It's Christ. That's the bread that's falling down from heaven, from my whereby men partake of and hunger no more. Don't love just the means. Love the promise of Christ. Don't just love the bread. Love the one who gives the bread. So that's my question for you this morning. Are you just satisfied in getting the bread in the text? The physical, natural element of the bread. Or are you truly, truly satisfied in the one who is the bread? Christ himself. Are you satisfied in the means over Christ, in temporal blessings over Christ, in earthly goods over Christ? Is that your peace? When things start to get better in your life, when your anxiety in X, Y, or Z begin to have some peace in them, now do you feel secure? Well, I would say, then that is your Savior. That which gives you the most peace, that's your Savior. Because you're finding joy in these elements being fixed rather than finding joy in Christ who's holding you regardless if the elements are fixed or not. So my, my hope is in this text, you'll see the provision. You'll see that Christ is compassionate and able to deliver his people in the wilderness. But I would pray that you'd be able to say in your heart, regardless if the provision comes, regardless if I'm delivered, regardless if the anxieties of life ever go away, I will have peace. Like Paul, 
in prison says, I've known what it is to have, I know what it is to want, but regardless, I was completely at peace because of Christ and my relationship with him. I was completely satisfied and content because of the the sufficiency I had in Christ. A quick word in ending to those in the text who might be a little bit self-righteous or proud. Would anyone that was in this crowd receive bread and say, I got this bread by myself. I made this bread appear. I was the one who went and looked for bread and looked for fish. No, never. So what I'm saying is, if you, Christian, are enjoying a good season of life, if you are enjoying a happy season of life, you're not the one ultimately responsible for that either. You are too dependent on on Christ even for the good moments of life. So don't begin to look at those who are suffering and think, man, I can't believe they're going through that. I would never go through that. Man, I can't believe they're suffering with this sin. I would never suffer. No, don't you see it's all coming from heaven? We are all to be humble. We are all to walk in this life together, in this pilgrimage together. So if I have bread from heaven, praise God, because I did nothing for it. I received that from heaven. If you are needing bread from heaven, I know who the source is. It's not me. It's God. It's Christ. So be humble even if you are going through a, a, a nice, kind season of life because you did nothing to deserve that. It fell from heaven himself in Christ Jesus as well. And lastly, unbelievers, you're searching. You're walking this world and this life hoping to find this bread. You're going to and fro, starving to death. Literally, without your knowledge, you are the walking dead going to trying to find bread that will give you life. You taste every meal of sin, every bread that's out there, and you're never satisfied. Unbeliever, you will never be satisfied apart from Christ. You will never find any bread that gives you true satisfaction and joy and peace. You're starving to death. But praise God, just as much as there was bread falling in the text, that bread is still falling today. His name is Christ. And all who come to him may partake of him freely and eat and never grow hungry again. He's being offered even this morning for you, unbeliever. Christian, we have an amazing Christ who is giving us provisions in the wilderness in this pilgrimage we call life and even the blessing of having each other to go to, through life together with. We have a, a mighty provision in Christ not a weak one. Let's pray. Lord, we praise you that you see us in our trials, that you remember us in our weakness, that you pass us not, O gentle Savior. Sometimes the trials last two, three, four days, sometimes months, sometimes even years. Sometimes there is no end to the trial. But the point is, Lord, if we have Christ, then we're able to, to find joy and peace in that trial because He's the bread from heaven. He's the true provision. He's the true source of peace and comfort. Thank you for Christ. May we truly feast on Him by faith this morning. In His name we pray. Amen. Will you please stand as we sing our song?